to speak first of all about um, a very special lady who was very pivotal in the communities of Manor Hamilton and Kitty Clapper, and that of course was Oliver Parkinson. And our first lecture today will be given by Professor Mary McCall, who is sitting here, um, Mary of VCD. And the lecture is an inaugural memorial lecture. It's the memorial lecture for Oliver Parkinson. So before I introduce Mary, I'll just say a few words on behalf of myself and the Summer School Committee. Today is Sean Mitchell and the Summer School remembers Orla Parkinson. A woman whose presence in the communities of Manhattan and Kitty Connor touched so many people in so many ways. Through her many talents, her active involvement in our communities, her job in the county library service, her great passion for history, her contribution to many community activities and events. She touched us through her family, staunch her husband, and her children, Oshi, Nula, and Olivia. But above all, through her kindness, her consideration, and her instant readiness to help others. And I'm going to say that I would have been on the receiving end of that. We welcome all this family here today and say that we were all the better for having known Orla and her goodness. And now I would like to introduce Jane Leonard, Jane, Jane Leonard, um, who was involved with Orla during her college days in the Trinity History Workshop, a group of Trinity College students who worked with David Fitzpatrick to reactivate scholarship on the Irish experience of the Great War. Their work is still cited by historians today. Jane will now remember Orla and read a tribute to her written by Jane's husband, David Fitzpatrick, some months prior to his death in February 2019. Jane Fitzpatrick. Read these uh, words he wrote last November. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am honoured to have been invited to introduce this lecture in memory of Royal Parkinson, and I only wish that I could be here in person to offer my tribute. I can scarcely believe that a third of a century has passed since Orla, as a student at Trinity College, took my course on Ireland and the Great War. Orla was one of a group of unusually enthusiastic and able students who shared my perplexity as an Australian that the war's impact on Southern Ireland had been almost universally ignored by historians, politicians and the public. Even in Northern Ireland, where the Battle of the Somme became almost as important an anniversary as the Battle of the Boyne, there had been no serious research on the scale and profile of military enlistment or the domestic consequences of that global conflagration. As the first crop of research essays were delivered in late 1985, I realised that we could do something practical about this collective failure. Why not publish a book of student essays based on original research and put the professional historians to shame? We would do everything ourselves, with students raising sponsorship, typing up handwritten essays, uh, checking gallery proofs, folding sections, signing the, book, the cover and distributing the book. We would become masters of the new genre of, of desktop publishing. I remember myself how excited we all were learning how to work process. It seems so, it seems like it really seems like another era now. Um, we would become masters of the new genre of desktop publishing. We knew we had allies like Kevin Myers who were already on the warpath and we publicised our efforts to do justice to Ireland's war, which had involved the biggest military mobilisation and death toll in Irish history. So the second set of term essays for which students received no academic credit was in fact a series of draft chapters. Students often working together went around Dublin and beyond, taking photographs of war memorials, inspecting the then unkempt Irish National War Memorial Gardens at Island Bridge, and discovering unused sources in libraries and archives. We called ourselves the Trinity History Workshop and it has survived to this day. Though Orla did not herself contribute an essay, she was a key member of that class which committed so much energy and intelligence to this heady enterprise, little knowing how much labour and angst would be expended before our book was launched just after the annual exams. The first edition was almost immediately sold out, the reviews were universally positive. Lilliput Press did a commercial reissue a couple of years later, and those undergraduate essays um, were soon been cited in, in footnotes by scholars. Um, <laughs> such as the reward for almost being the first in the field. After she left Trinity, I lost touch with Orla's doings until Scott told me the terrible news of her death last May. I was touched by the fact that, admit, that, a, that admit, amidst all of Orla's other enterprises and professional preoccupations, she had never lost her fervent desire to recognise Ireland's part in the Great War and to commemorate those who fought. I was moved by Orla's poem, Armistice Day 2009, which expressed the sentiments widely held today, but which were once unvoiceable. And she wrote, We mark our common world of wasted lives, mute men in grey Glasnevin cemetery in Manitoba. The centennial commemoration of the Great War, especially by local historians and societies, has done much to atone for the aphasia that afflicted earlier generations that inability to speak or write publicly about what had remained common knowledge within so many Irish families. The rediscovery of Ireland's war is just part of a broader crusade to demolish, to demolish the, <coughs> the arbitrary boundaries by which historians have made life easier for themselves. These include the collective failure to incorporate women as full participants in human history on the spurious grounds that most readily access, accessible documents tended to be written by men for men. In fact, with a little imagination and plenty of sweat, we can mine a, a limitless quarry of testimony and deeds which illuminate what, what gender entailed in the Irish past. And of course, we're looking forward very much. David was a great admirer of Mary's work, so we're looking forward very much to what we're about to hear. Um, the first step, as with the Great War, is to do justice to the quote, contribution of women in every sphere, whether it's economic, social, spiritual, or political. Honouring forgotten women through historical research is another example of, of overdue atonement. Yet that is but a necessary prelude to something which is even more demanding, a balanced appraisal of the total historical experience. Not all war dead were heroes, not, not all women were courageous survivors. Whatever slant we adopt in disentangling Irish history, we are bound to uncover base motives and moral ambiguity as well as virtue. 
candidly acknowledging and exploring these ambiguities, ambiguities is the great challenge for future historians, and I think it's something that this summer school in particular is already sort of map, 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 mapping out a very courageous path, and we now move into the sort of really awkward years of, 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 of commemoration, the sort of 19, 19 to 1923 period, and the rifts and the divisions and, 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 and all of those legacies that we speak, that we still that we still have to have to disentangle. So um, just to conclude, um, David, if he was here, wanted to conclude by saying, um, I ask you all to raise a metaphorical toast to the memory of Royal Parkinson, whose sense of history was so deeply enmeshed with her moral convictions as a true member of this community. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Marion Collins who will speak on the title behind me, Irish Revolutionary Women, Contributions, Experiences and Legacies. Mary McCulloch is an Assistant Professor of Gender Studies at UCD and holds a PhD from the School of History and Humanities in Trinity College. Her latest publications are We Were There, 77 Women of the East Rising, and Kerry 1916, Histories and Legacies of the East Rising, um, of which she was co-editor. Her latest research includes a forthcoming biography of Margaret Skinner and a major research project on gendered and sexual violence during the Irish Revolutionary period, 
uh, and over 600 Kandaman women would be imprisoned during that year, 18 months. At regional level, however, the histories of the organization are less well known. Lack of enough documentation to date, included <laughs> detail in the history, but the digitization of sources such as the military services pensions applications and the Bureau of Military History, and the renewed interest in and collection of and access to sources by and about women of the period, uh, now means we can undertake these much needed broader uh, and inclusive histories. So, coming on, just to give you a, a, a background, and many of you would know this already, Coming Among was founded in Dublin in 1914 as an organisation for women who espoused a nationalist ideology and who was supposed to be a support to the Irish volunteers who had been founded in 1913, November 1913. Now, the Irish volunteers didn't allow women to join, so the women set up their own advanced nationalist organisation. They adopted a green uniform with a slouch hat and a badge, a rifle with the initials of the organisation. Many of you would know this now because it has become very much part of the commemoration and oftentimes you see uh, reenactors wearing the uniform and the badge. This means their militarism was evident from their uniform statements and training from the very beginning. The organisation, as I said, participated fully in Easter 1916. Almost all the women, other than a few in the Irish Citizen Army, about 25 or 30 of them, who participated in the Rising were members of Common Armand. When the confusion was rife about order and counter-order and countermands by Owen McNeil in the initial stage of the Rising, it is the women of Common Armand who traverse the country carrying messages from Pierce, Connolly, and the other leaders, including John McDermott in the GPO, to say that the Rising was on. During the week of the Rising, there were coming among women in all the outposts, except, of course, most famously, Bowman's Mill. As the week ended and the defeat became inevitable, Pierce selected Elizabeth O'Farrell, a long-time coming among member, feminist activist, suffragette, and this is quite common with the women of coming among. They were not just nationalists, many of them in suffrage activism, in trade union activism during 1913, uh, many had been in Inini in, in the Heron prior to joining Common Amman. So Elizabeth O'Farrell presented the surrender to the British authorities. O'Farrell, a working class Dublin woman, born and raised in the tenements on City Quay, had been a long time member of Common Amman. Like so many women, women, she had also been involved in the Gaelic League, Inini in the Heron, and had been a member of Hannishy Skeffington Suffrage Organisation, the Irish Women's Franchise League. She was also a member of the Irish Women's Workers' Union and had worked in Liberty Hall uh, to help feed the poor of Dublin during the lockout of 1913. And I think this is, uh, reminds me of the conversation last night we had here about, um, particularly with Pascal Mooney, about the young women uh, today who are getting more involved in politics. It seems to be a generational thing. And, and in this 100 year anniversary, uh, you have young women getting involved in all sorts of politics now, as you had 100 years ago. And Roy Foster talks very um, vividly, in vivid faces, his book, uh, about this generational involvement in all of these new politics, the politics of women, the politics of labour, and the national politics uh, in uh, the early 20th century. And women were central to this. So in the post-rising period, Common Amman worked to keep the revolutionary spirit alive in Ireland, as many of the main le uh, leadership were either dead or languishing in prison. For instance, in 1917, they sent an appeal to the president of the USA, Woodrow Wilson, um, a real president, not like the fellow we have today, uh, <laughs> looking for his recognition <coughs> and justice for Ireland's demands for political freedom. Uh, Hennessy Skeffington delivered that to him in the White House. By 1918, Common Amman were fighting both for the freedom for Ireland and equal citizenship within that new state for all, regardless of gender. By then, its president, Countess Markovich, stated Common Amman demanded full suffrage, and at the 1918 Common Amman Convention, the women reaffirmed their role in fighting for an Irish Republic, but they also insisted that they would follow the policy of the Republican proclamation by seeing that women take up their proper position in the life of the nation, as promised in the 1916 Proclamation of Equality, uh, which is the most radical promise, I would argue, in the 1916 Proclamation. Yes. yes. For Common Amman nationally and regionally, the biggest campaigns in 1917 and 18 were the anti-conscription and election campaigns. 
uh, by-elections in 1917, and then, of course, the general election in 1918. <laughs> Fearing a major push by Germany, now that Russia was out, out of the war, uh, and badly in need of fresh recruits, but against the advice due to the fertile si political situation in Ireland, the British government passed the Military Services Bill in early 19, April 1917, introducing conscription to Ireland. The reaction was immediate, with all shades of political and militant nationalism coming together to resist uh, conscription. Not only politics, but the Catholic Church was very much involved in this, as were the trade unions. With the backing of the trade unions, April 23rd, 1917 was a day of anti-conscription activities, fundraising, incendiary speech making and pledge signing in parishes, towns and villages across the country. Interestingly, women, organised by the Irish Women's Workers' Union and Come and Mom, took their own pledge, which included the promise not to fill the faces of men deprived of their work through enforced military service. Irish women were not going to be the supportive home front if their men went off to war. They would not, as they said, black men. While this campaign of resistance was successful, the British authorities did not react well to the ongoing anti-conscription activities. In May 1918, dozens of nationalist leaders, including three women, Countess Markovich, Maud Gaughan, and Kathleen Clark, were arrested as part of the so-called German plot and reinterred. Uh, Lord French, who accepted mass conscription was now dead in the water, said he would accept 50,000 Irish volunteers, a statement which encouraged the women to keep up their anti-conscription activities. And this, um, is Law and Amman. In June 1918, Common became the lead group at organising Law and Amman, or Women's Day, as it was, uh, because they were in the best position to organise nationwide. While all of the different women's groups on the committee had been involved in the general strike earlier that year against conscription uh, on, uh, on April 23rd, Law and Amman would be a spectacular, culminating to their ongoing, uh, a spectacular culmination to their ongoing resistance to conscription and common among, resurgent and growing in numbers, was indeed less placed to deliver on a countrywide involvement. Newspaper reports from around the country show that commons uh, made an impressive turnout. Throughout the country, pledges were signed in almost every city and town, mostly as, the mar as part of marches to a local church, often followed by rosaries or benedictions. This is a very interesting part of common among activism that I'm uh, going to be looking into uh, later on is how they used, how they, uh, I suppose, militarised the saying of the rosary uh, outside prisons as part of marches, uh, and particularly after they had been outlawed or banned by the Crown um, authorities, um, they would march to local churches or local prisons where maybe IRA men were imprisoned and say mass rosaries. Uh, and so it's really about politicising uh, the practice of, of, of uh, the Catholic faith at this time, and of course you couldn't really arrest a group of women for saying the rosary. So they're, they're, they're able to get away with their activism by covering it up in the respectability of, of um, Catholicism. Reports in the Free Men journals mention about 400 women signed, for example, in Donegal and County Carmel, 800 women in Coast County Park, 1,200 women in Care and Tipperary, while impressive shows were held in Dundalk, Sneem, Castle Island, County Kerry, and a thousand women, and we have all their names uh, signed in Kilkenny. The actual role they signed there still, is still extant. Most of them we don't have, unfortunately. <laughs> the Donegal News reported that there was a splendid turnout in Derry, while in Stravan, over 2,000 women marched to the local church carrying flowers where they signed a purse. The Irish Examiner reported from around the country it included 200 women signing in Dungarvan County Waterford while a good many names were signed in the book in Kinmare County Kerry. Not all uh, names I are pledging took place on June the 9th because it was a very bad day and it was raining, so uh, other places postponed it. In Longford, for instance, Law and Amon happened a week later where over 120 women signed a pledge in Granard. Uh, in Donegal, the pledge continued all month and over 2,700 finally signed by the end of the month. In Cork, the pledge was not signed until July the 7th, where over um, almost a thousand women signed at the church doors. In Dublin alone, and, uh, and the suburb of Dublin included, almost 40,000 women signed the pledge, <coughs> including signatures that were sent in from convents where the, the entire um, um, population of nuns in convents had signed the pledge. 
Long Island proved a very successful day for Cullen Mann. It demonstrated the reach and organizational ability of the organization by 1918 and its ability to organize mass civil disobedience on a countrywide level. The pledge not to take men's jobs if conscription happened was a very visible demonstration of opposition to conscription and the war and a warning to the British government that the economy could be crippled in the event of pressing ahead with its plans. As noted by uh, historian Senia Pizzetta, Women's Day signified that the women's protest had become a fact of Irish political life by 1918. It also signified that the research in Common Among was now the biggest, most influential women's organisation in the country. And for Common Among, the momentous success of Women's Day was an enormous propaganda coup. They were now the organisation. Uh, while the other suffrage groups were still in existence, Common Among was where it was at, basically, in 1918, if you wanted to be a political woman. The very public demonstrations of its ability to organise nationwide uh, mass civil uh, events of civil disobedience brought in new members. Um, a lot of the pension files show young women saying, I saw the women on marching on Women's Day or at Mon, or at funerals of, of Irish volunteers who died in jail, particularly after the, uh, from the effects of the uh, flu at the time. Um, quite a number of them died, uh, and their funerals were politicised, but the people who organised the propaganda uh, events around the funerals were coming among. And so the more propaganda events they did, the more young women joined. Um, however, that didn't mean that women were uh, allowed into national politics easily. Uh, when the general election of December 1918 was called, only two women were selected for, to run. In the next um, and of course, this is the most famous one. Uh, the common among women and the Irish Women's Franchise League women were quite angry about this. They had <coughs> sent out a list both of nationalist women, of constitutional nationalist women who could have run for the Irish Parliamentary Party, and indeed of unionist women who could have run for the, for the unionist side. Uh, however, in the end, only two women ran in the 1918 election. Countess Markovich in the St. Patrick's Division in Dublin, who won her seat, and Winifred Carney in Loyalist East Belfast, Belfast who did not, did not win her seat. In fact, she said she had the worst campaign in the country. She had no help whatsoever from Sinn Féin. But she also ran as a socialist candidate under a, a broad Sinn Féin ticket. Um, she, she never gave up on her, her uh, socialism that she shared with Connolly. Despite their disappointment the more, that more women candidates were selected, coming among through their energies in getting Sinn Féin candidates elected, and most especially in getting their president, Countess Markovic, elected. Well organised and well able to produce election materials, propaganda, and in mobilising activists coming, uh, countrywide, coming among directed successfully the majority of female voters towards Sinn Féin. Uh, and again, it was, the, the voters were over the age of 30 with certain property qualifications. But I have found evidence that young activist women did vote um, illegally. They personated on the day. How much that had an effect on uh, the actual voting, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to tell. But they do talk about changing their clothes several times and voting more than once uh, during the day. Now, that wasn't unusual at that time. Electoral lists weren't very well kept. And of course, the women had only been included on the electoral lists uh, months before. So you know, people only knew women by their probably married name, Mrs. So and so. Um, and so, if you looked a little bit older and said you were Mrs. So and so, they were not going to challenge you. <coughs> and then some of the nationalist women who were under the age of 30 said, Well, it was their right. They fought for the vote. They didn't care that they technically weren't eligible. Uh, so, they went and voted. Uh, in the end, Sinn Fein won 73 out of 105 seats, obliterating the Irish Parliamentary Party and becoming the largest representative party in Ireland. So what did this mean for Common Among? All the activities saw young women joining Common Among in large numbers throughout the country. While the larger towns and their outlying areas had branches prior to 1916, now the organisation spread to every village and small town. The evidence from the military archives indicates a substantial increase in numbers, with many applicants spent their aid for pensions stating that they joined either in 1917 or 1918. In particular, the anti-conscription campaign or a work of organisers like Alice Cashel here, Mrs. Anya Kant, 
uh, widow of 1916, Rudolf Ravenkamp, Anya O'Rahilly, the sister of Guy O'Rahilly, and her niece Sheila Humphreys, helped organise a number of branches along with uh, visits to the camp to counties from senior members like Countess Markovitch when she wasn't in jail, uh, who campaigned around the country and encouraged women to join coming along. That 1918 annual convention was delighted to hear of the expansion of the organisation, which was, had risen from 100 branches in 1917 to 600 branches by September 1918. The credit for this expansion was the general spread of republicanism, and uh, the work of travelling from and among organisers, they were paid, so they did it as their full-time job. The anti-conscription campaigns organised to combat the conscription threat. Combined with the influence felt locally and from such events as the death and uh, funeral, for example, of Kerry Van Thomas Ash, who died on hunger strike in September 1917. Again, another propaganda coup, probably the biggest single um, uh, propaganda funeral since the O'Donovan Rossa uh, uh, in 1914. And so that brings more and more women into the coming on, as well as young men into the Irish Volunteers, which are now uh, becoming the IRA. Common Law issued a declaration of its policies in 1918-1919. As I said, its first aim was to follow the Republican proclamation to see that women would take up their proper position in the life of the nation. So they're becoming more feminist in their ideals. They are also to fundraise to arm and equip the body of men and women. 1914, they just said men. Now it's men and women. And to develop military activities in conjunction with the Irish Volunteers. So they're moving from the idea <coughs> of being auxiliaries to be allies, to be comrades with the Irish Volunteers, to fighting shoulder to shoulder for uh, their ideal of the Republic. This, as historian Margaret Ward notes, clearly revealed a desire on the part of common among to become the military equals of the Irish Volunteers. Despite this more feminist stance on equality, the reality was, however, on the ground that common among looked to the local IRA, local branches looked to the local IRA commandants for military leadership. In the 1919 Lara Le it was suggested that the captain of the local branch keep in touch with the volunteer battalion to get his help in organising signalling and other classes and put herself under his orders in all military operations. But that shows they, they, they saw themselves as part of an army. They saw themselves as militant, uh, as, as fighters in a revolutionary army. So the first shots of the Irish uh, War of Independence are accepted as being shot at Salahit uh, in County Tipperary, which is commemorated earlier this year, in January uh, 21st, 1919. The two IRIC constables escorting a group of workers carrying explosives from their local quarry were ambushed and killed by the local volunteers who were trying to get the explosives. <coughs> Coincidentally, on that day, 21st of January 1919, the first meeting of the First Oil also took place at the Mansion House. How do we read then the participation of women in the Irish War of Independence? And that is changing with the opening up of the new archives, particularly the military archives. And this is a project I am doing as well as the sexual violence, is looking at these ambushes. Because we argue oftentimes about false surrenders and who shot first and who was at the ambush and all this sort of thing. I think it's also important to relook really at women's contribution to these events and the experience of women <laughs> in this war as militants. While first aid signalling and dispatch carrying was the usual work of the on, there is evidence that the work they carried out, even early in 1919, contributed to the military side of the war. So what I want to do today is take a closer look at Salah Sol Edbe. Many of you would know the story. It's, it's <coughs> usually the first thing mentioned when you talk about the war of independence. Uh, Recently, a blog on the military pension site has shown that we can do a gendered, inclusive reading of Salah Edbe uh, on the 21st of January. Dan Green and Sean Tracy were among the men most famous for the ambush, but using the military archives, we can see there was a full common, common amount of involvement in the ambush, which rarely makes it into the history books. From the archives, we know now that the 3rd Tipperary Brigade had eight IRA men in position, two volunteers on bicycles, and a number of common man men, women, on scout duty. And this was very important. They were the ones who had to give the signal when the, um, uh, the RIC were arriving. For example, Katie Coffey of the uh, Donovan Company of Common Man said in her pension application 
that she provided intelligence in the run up to the ambush and did scout work 500 yards from the scene of the shooting. Lena Crow of the Salah Edbeg branch of Tumanaman claimed she did similar, similar service on the day of the ambush, while Marianne Tobin of Care in County Tipperary took in at least three IRA members after the ambush and helped find them further safe houses. Indeed, Dan Green, Dan Green in a, a handwritten letter of reference uh, in the 1950s when Tobin was applying for a pension said, Marion Tobin was our most trusted person in Tipperary. Sean Tracy, Sean Hogan and myself went to her home after Salah Bay, and it was Mrs. Tobin who made contact for us and houses for us for several days when the area was very hot. It was um, flooded with uh, RIC and Crown forces looking for the ambushers. Mrs. Tobin was well known to Ernie O'Malley, Dennis Lacey, Seamus Robinson and her pet was Sean Tracy. <laughs> So this type, this type of service was typical of the invaluable and dangerous service coming among women provided throughout the country during the War of Independence. Much of what coming among women did was expected uh, of an auxiliary force, I suppose, or a backup force, but was also indispensable to the conduct of a guerrilla warfare. The women provided a service in a number of important areas, running safe houses, as we know, caring for IRA men on the run, nursing injured volunteers, they couldn't go to hospital, they'd be arrested. Providing lines of communications for the IRA, uh, I suppose they were the Twitter accounts of the day, um, carrying dispatches and taking care of arms dumps. Food, shelter and care were vital to the success of the guerrilla army. And women's role in the provision of these is often dismissed as within their domestic duties, as if it is of no importance to what the IRA were actually doing. However, these rules were, as Dan Green himself wrote, indispensable to the army. But other indispensable roles he mentioned had a more military aspect, including carrying dispatches, scouting, and acting as intelligence agents. Their work as intelligence officers, Green wrote, was vital to the well-being of the IRA. So the involvement of Kamenamon in direct military action is something that's often overlooked. Yet without them, I would argue, the guerrilla warfare engaged in by the IRA could not have been successfully carried out, and they could not have fought the Crown forces to a standstill. They probably wouldn't have been able to win the war anyway because of the nature of the war, but they fought to get to the negotiation table, and without the women, would they have been as successful? For instance, um, acquiring, delivering, and caring for arms and ammunition, and, and all the women knew how to <coughs> key rifles and make bombs, basically make home on bombs, um, was of extreme importance to the IRA, and much of this was carried out by Cumberland. May Hearn, for example, in Valley Dunham, Cumberland, there she is in the centre with the tie and with the North Kerry flying column, uh, was very active in the area of North Kerry. In May 1920, she shifted a rifle and two boxes from the stove, and later she brought a bag containing six bombs, six revolvers, and ammunition off the train at Kilwarna Station when over 40 British forces were positioned there to her home. Um, and they used their femininity. They knew that the soldiers wouldn't closely search women. So they used their position as women in a society that had very much a separate sphere, uh, ideology, uh, to walk past 40 British forces surrounding the train. She walks out with six bombs in the bag. <laughs> Intelligence, I thought it was dangerous work. Intelligence work, scouting, delivering arms and ammunition to sites of ambushes were also important aspects of the military side of work undertaken by a common man. Women who lived near RIC stations and barracks where Black and Tans and auxiliaries were stationed were a vital link in the intelligence chain for the local IRA. <coughs> May Hearn, again, was involved in the Gale Bridge ambush of the Crown Forces in May 1920. She provided intelligence, did scouting work prior to the ambush, and took charge of a revolver, ammunition, and handcuffs that were taken in the ambush. She also stated that she provided a rifle and ammunition which were subsequently used in an attack on Ballybunion barracks. But what happened then? Sometimes the coming among women carried out their duties under extreme, under conditions of extreme danger. And this is the experience that I want to talk about. We heard from Julia Duffy, Ballina Lee coming along in Longford. Her house was raided several times by the Black and Tans, and on one occasion they brought her outside and beat her about the head mostly. They broke nine of her teeth, 
and she says, I had to get my teeth extracted three days later. And this is not unusual. In December 1920, after another raid, she and her mother and sister were burnt out. She was unsurprised, as she said herself, because they knew her not to be so silly as not to know when so prominent her brother was in uh, uh, the IRA. And they would have known her brother as if it was adjunct, adjunct, adjutant in the local IRA. Bridget O'Donnell, in Valley Landers, County Limerick, whose house was known as a slave, safe house used by the IRA for the attack on the Valley Landers RIC station in the summer of 1920, sent her father away for, for safety while she kept men in the house and had an arms dump in the back of the house. It was no surprise to her then after the attack in Kilmallock uh, Barracks, uh, when she was involved as a scout, that her home was bombed by the back of towns at about 2.30 a.m. in the morning. She said all the shop windows and the goods of the windows were shattered, and two weeks later they came back and finished the job and burnt the house down. Interestingly, for women like Julia Duffy and Bridget O'Donnell, uh, these this not, did not stop the women continuing their work for the IRA. Uh, and for example, O'Donnell went off to live in Mount Blanc, where she continued to help transporting arms, helping men on the run, helping with current coordination and scouting. Similarly, Margaret Brennan of Malik in County Limerick, whose activities brought her to the attention of the authorities, had her comfortable home burnt out uh, and destroyed by fire. She was, she wrote, compelled to stand the mental torture of seeing her delicate mother disturbed by brutal raids on her own. And it's interesting, in many of these pension files, there seems to be transference of what of mental trauma suffered from these raids. The women always talk about somebody else in their family uh, being traumatised, not themselves, because they continue their work. They see this as part of their work for Ireland, but their mother has a mental breakdown, or their sister, um, so maybe that's a deflection of what they're feeling inside. So. Uh, Cissy McGowan of Tullagown in County Leitrim uh, talked about the fact that after the money gold ambush, her house was raided and her brother arrested. She was ordered to leave the country or face being shot. She did not return to her home at night from that time until the truce. The money gold ambush happened on October 25th, 1920, for the IRA and most nine men are IC patrol killing four. The auxiliaries who were stationed at the, re the residence of the um, McDermott of Colada travelled to North Side Road and Leitrim sometime after and searched the countryside. Uh, the county inspector reported the houses of some leading suspects were burnt, that meant the women's houses, as well as that of Father O'Fanican uh, Shafe Hall at Kiffany. Um, so many houses were burnt all around the country. Uh, and this is part of the intimate side of war, where the home front and the battle front are actually the same thing. They're inside in the domestic space. As well as running safe houses, feeding, feeding and caring for IRA men and carrying dispatches, common law women also undertook the difficult and traumatic work of caring for and burying the dead. When the IRA men on active duty service were killed, it was often the role of common law women to retrieve their bodies, prepare them for burial, and make sure the proper burial rituals, religious and republican, were carried out. Nora O'Sullivan, for example, Nee Walsh, a member of the Bally Dunhu branch in County Kerry, notes in her pension application that she helped identify, uh, identify and retrieve the bodies of three men killed at Burton Maglana and Nakanua. Patrick, Patrick Walsh, Jeremiah Lyons, and Patrick Dalton were ambushed and shot by Black and Tans in May 1921. The Crown forces took the bodies of the dead men to Bally Mullen Barracks in Tralee, where O'Sullivan and a group of common law women from Bally Dillon who went and, as she says, identified the bodies of three IRA men shot and uh, had them coffined and brought back by I was subject to brutal treatment from drunken tans and military. And this is a photograph I have found of recently of the burial of one of the Jeremiah Lines in Joal Village, which is the village I'm from in North Kerry. And the woman there with her head bowed with the hat is my grandmother at the graveside of, of Jeremiah Lyons. Uh, she was the secretary of the local common law, so she prepared his body for burial. Ellie Tiernan of the Drumrily branch in Northwest Common talked about marching eight miles for the funerals of volunteers Sean Connolly, Seamus Wren, and Joe Byrne, and laying wreaths on their graves. It's also during this period that active common law members uh, began to experience the worst of the raids and reprisals. When Marx, Marx raiders were come to threaten 
bully and burn out their homes. Descriptions and sources such as the military pension files, the Bureau of Military History and other archival materials details the escalation and intensity of violence perpetuated on women in their domestic space. Attacks on women, uh, attacks on homes affected women militants more than men, and many of common among women who later applied for military pensions detailed raids and burning at their homes. The interim report from the American Commission on Conditions in Ireland of 1920 also details some of the violence visited on women, women during these raids. Women, it said, had the privacy of their bedrooms invaded in the dead of night and their hair cut off. Such was the terror of the population that it was reported, quote, in some places, those who were not on the run and the infirm and aged, the women and children, would appear to feel safer in the fields than in their homes. Yes, sir. As Liv Conlon, uh, no, if you want, sorry, I forgot to. <coughs> yes, sir. Here. Liv Conlon, a member of Cork Common Law, wrote in her memoirs uh, In late 1920 and 1921, the British authorities began to recognise the importance of Common Law mm -hmm. to the real world. Attention, she said, was focused on the women very much at this time by the authorities. They were in receipt of information from their intelligence division, going to raids and captures of documents, and they fully realised that women were playing a major role in the campaign. The going was tough on the female sex. They were unable to go on the run, so were constantly subjected to having their homes raided and precious possessions destroyed. To intensify the reign of terror, swoops were made at night, entries forced into their homes, the women's hair cut off in brutal fashion, as well as suffering other indignities and insults. It is during this period that common among women began to experience the worst of the rates of the reprisals. Uh, as Louis, Louise Ryan wrote, women within this home front took great risks, providing shelter for our women on the run, which was for the women a demanding and risk-filled task. There must be, as Justin Silver Dolan writes, some acknowledgement that the women who bore the brunt of the raids and interrogations, some acknowledgement that they did bear the brunt of the raids and interrogations, and this suggests that some of the vital contributions to the independent movements took a place away from the ambush site. And this is my argument, that the ambushes make it into the issue because they're very dramatic, but actually an awful lot of the um, uh, contributions to the independence movement, as Stoker uh, says, happens in the domestic space. However, these incidents, as reported by women of Common Law, come as no great shock to them. As the research continues, it is important to consider the use of language in the sources. The absence of clear language, the use of words like rape or sexual assault from the records, has led to an acceptance that there was a low occurrence of instance of this sort during the War of Independence, that the Irish War was exceptional in this case, and was a key war when it came to women, uh, it is uh, considered. Even contemporary investigations seem to indicate this. Much of the ev uh, evidence presented before the American Commission on Conditions in Ireland in 1920 indicated that there was very little sexual crime. While Habashi Skeffington gave a statement to the Commission on Violence Against Women, it contained only one reference to an alleged rape uh, the rape of Carol in the presence of her father reported in Galway near Gart, but not fully investigated yet. The Commission did report back that this, uh, scarcity, the sanctity of the home was often violated by crime forces, which showed little evidence of sexualized violence. However, as we look more into the detail, I, I think we are challenging that idea. Indeed, even contemporary documents challenge that idea. Meg Connery of the Irish Women's Franchise League who looked into sexual assault in 1921, wrote that women knew that it was during curfew hours that attempts of a sexual nature were made, and many suffered from their nerves because of this. And then Colin does distinguish in her writings between a woman having her hair cut off in brutal fashion during attacks of wounds, and the fact that she might suffer other indignities and insults. Is this euphemistic vagueness of other indignities and insults that language often serves to obscure from the sources. It is important then to mine down into contemporary language and, and, and terms used to describe attacks and war on women. Next one, please. As Lindsay Erna Byrne notes, the term outrage, for example, was often a euphemism for physical or sexual assault, which was also adopted to cover more general violence. The use of this term 
to describe or indeed hide sexual assault in a uh, contemporary sense, an emphasis on moral outrage rather than an understanding of the devastation of sexual violation. The term outrage is used in a multitude of ways to denote attacks, ambushes, assaults of people, animals and property and agrarian outrage, but also to denote sexual violence suffered by women during this period. So terror, fear, violation, degradation, they were all elements of the violence perpetrated on women and girls in this specific period in Irish history, for a specific reason. Most of these attacks focused in on the female body, isolated and terrorised and manhandled in brutal fashion. The home was, in fact, the front line for women, particularly for Mon women, who lived in the communities that had become conduits of aids of in and information for the IRA and enemies to be stopped by the armed forces. They were working for a cause, and the dangers of that work included coming to the attention of the armed forces. In most cases, women stoically continued their work for the Republican cause, and it continued on into the Civil War. Their, their seeming stoicism, emotional and psychological recovery from violence, uh, is in stark contrast to the experience of women not associated with coming on or actively involved in war. And I want to conclude with a few remarks on memory. So the activities of Common Amman were integral, as we know now, to the independence campaign. In their more domestic roles as nurturers and carers, and in their roles as militants, they provided a service without which the campaign conducted by the IRA could not have succeeded to the extent that it did. Their ability to move freely as women meant that their roles as scouts, intelligence gatherers, message carriers, and their expertise in securing, secreting, and transporting arms and ammunition was vital to the guerrilla war. This was acknowledged in 1921, when several IRA commandants wrote, there's no question that the girls, they always call them girls, were only helping. In dispatch carrying, scouting, and intelligence work, all of which was highly dangerous, they did far more than most soldiers. In addition to this, the flying columns would have collapsed early this year were it not for the assistance of women organised and unorganised. The fact that they did not and could not go on the run meant that they experienced the full brutality then of reprisals carried out by the Crown forces on homes and communities. Both their contributions and their suffering, however, has often been ignored or overlooked in both national and regional studies. As Marie Coleman notes, in the fighting stories produced by the Kerrymen in the uh, late 1940s, so the Kerry fighting story, Cork fighting story, uh, etc., etc. The role of Kamala Man was relegated to a couple of pages at the end of the book. Where women were remembered in the traditional histories of the revolutionary period because they were loyal and courageous Kamala Man girls who carried out and looked, cared for and looked after men who fought for free Ireland. In addition, the psychological strain on women, families, and communities was immense. Women seemed to deal with the trauma uh, of terror in different ways. Common among women often talked about how they just continued with their work despite sometimes experiencing a violence and homelessness after being burnt out, as well as injury and insult. However, the trauma experienced by all remained a hidden subject in history from the 1920s onwards. While the subject of the war on women, terror attacks in homes and communities, head shaving, and attacks on women by the IRA as well, which I haven't really gone into in this paper, as well as the Crown Forces were regularly reported in the newspapers of the period, it all soon becomes an invisible subject in historical narratives. So with the opening up of so many new sources and revisiting existing material, we can now attempt to locate the extent of gendered and sexualized violence and place it within the historical narrative. This is actually, a, sorry before we go on, a British Pathé film. It's only about, if you go back, it's only about 13 seconds long, but it is of a woman who had been head cropped by the IRA, actually, in this case, uh, for company keeping. And that's what the IRA uh, mostly attacked women about, company keeping with their IC or um, Crown Forces. In fact, one guy, Leo Buckley from Tipperary, said, you know, it was difficult work, but we did it. We had to control the women because they could be carried away by a uniform. And I think in that sentence lies uh, what would become uh, the very uh, patriarchal system of the Irish free state, uh, the men who were controlling the women from company keeping go on to become the politicians of the Irish free state, which becomes very anti-women. 
With the opening up, therefore, of new archives, and especially digital access to archives, scholars are del delving deeper and producing more nuanced uh, analyses of roles and contribution of women from 1916. <laughs> As I said, up to 300 women participated then, and many thousands later. These women's roles are far broader. Yes, they served as nurses and first aid assistants, but they were also careers, medical carriers, intelligence gatherers, gun women, snipers, and military leaders in roles understood by most historians as integral and vital to the history of the revolutionary period. However, the intractable nurse narrative does continue. The fact that they were guardians of the patriot flame image, the forgotten women's stories, prove difficult to shift from public consciousness, even now. They are shifting. These narratives are embedded in public consciousness soon after the rising, uh, initially developed and circulated actually by the women themselves to propagandize Republican ideologies to mot uh, which motivated the patriotic debt. Later, male writers, historians and commentators usefully positioned women within a framework acceptable to a masculinist conservative state that had come into being. And it is these narratives that continue to be the dominant memory tropes. Widows and nurses are not generally the stuff of national narratives, but the ongoing understanding of the more militant contribution of women is inexorably challenging and changing the narrative of that um, um, type of uh, experience and contribution. <laughs> Commemoration, of course, cannot be ever separate from contemporary social, political, and cultural events. And so this period, 20, 2012 to 2023, reflects contemporary politics in the way we commemorate. Where gender equality within Irish society continues to be a much talked about, contested, uh, uh, and activist space. However, women's histories, are they, as they are uncovered, will continue to challenge and question the myths and histories of the revolutionary period. Broaden the role played by women, complicate our understanding of this revolutionary period, and question what constitutes an authentic past for past, as well as uncover the processes by which a gendered narrative was constructed and historicized. Thank you.